and broadcasting. All right. Hello, welcome, Digital Roundtable, May 5th. It is Cinco de Mayo. Oh my goodness, Mexican food, everybody. Did anybody have a good time yesterday? Today was Star, Star Wars Day, right? May 4th. May the 4th be with you. I think that's one of the cutest things ever invented. So we have a great show today, and uh, it's another beautiful day. I, you know, it looks like summer is actually accelerating. Uh, it's only 78 degrees, but yesterday it was 92 here, and it's starting to get hot. Um, we got a great guest to, with us today. Uh, let me go and say hello to John Sibley Butler, and let us roll with some music. John? Thank you. Sometimes when the night calls it a day, and I wake up down in this missing you kind of way. I remember things better left forgotten. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, John. How are you doing today, John? You know, I am doing very well. I'm looking at things around. I'm, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic, but the most interesting things to me now is, are, are the talk shows, which I listen to. To get a get a sense of what's going on, and you know there is this this debate now about should I take the vaccine, and I find it uh, very very interesting. It certainly has picked up on uh, on talk shows. So I think of, of all the science that we've done and, and how we think about getting out of this uh, pandemic, then it has changed from how many people will get it to who will not take it, and what is that effect? So I found it very, very interesting in, in interesting times like these, uh, you know, you turn to the, to the people's talk show and just listen. Another thing I found interesting is, is, is how the economy is, is trying to, uh, to bounce back. So it's been good. And of course, this is the last day of school at the University of Texas at Austin. And my heroes are my, are my students who are on college, on Zoom, rather than walking through the union and talking to people and picking up dates and having a good time. It's certainly been an interesting year, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned as we go forward. Absolutely, absolutely. Llewellyn, how are you, sir? Uh, the force is with me. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thank, glad, glad to have you, glad to have you. Look forward to, to this round table today. Uh, Sunil, how are you doing, sir? Thanks for joining us. Doing very well. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Sunil Cherian is the founder and CEO of, of a company called Esprey. And Esprey is a phenomenal company. We're going to get to learn all about it. Uh, They're really an innovative technology company that develops solutions for integrating renewable and distributed energy resources within microgrids and power systems for economic optimization, resiliency, enhancement, and decarbonization. Their headquarters is in Fort Collins, Colorado, a great place. They have developed, refined, and validated their control platform and many customer-driven applications through numerous full-scale and pilot projects in the Americas, the Caribbean, Europe, Africa and Southeast Asia. Spray's mission is to accelerate the world's transition to renewable energy through the deployment of microgrids everywhere. So Neil is a board member of the Colorado Clean Tech Industry Association and Colorado Clean Energy Cluster. He holds a PhD and a Bachelor of Science degrees from the Colorado State University and the College of Engineering at Trivandrum, respectively. He is an old friend and a great guy and a great pioneer in this industry. Welcome again, Sunil. Thank you, Andrews. Excellent, excellent. Well, let me let me get rolling with uh, with what's going on. You know, COVID seems to be uh, getting more under control, according to the. Uh, the feds, there are 248 million people vaccinated. That uh, means that in two or three weeks, 
we will have vaccinated just about everybody in the US, which is a great thing, except for those that don't wanna take the vaccine, of course. <laughs> it is their right not to wanna take it. Uh, and uh, it seems like all the trends in terms of cases and death are down. Uh, clearly, you know, one death is one too many. And there are still in my circle of, of, of living that I, I see some folks that have still, you know, impacted by this and it's sad to hear, but, uh, but clearly it seems like we finally, uh, through the vaccination, are uh, sort of reaching, reaching a place of plateau uh, and the economy seems to be telling us something similar. Things are trading sideways. I think there's a lot of expectation on the 2.3 trillion package to be approved somehow uh, on infrastructure and, and the 1.9 trillion is getting deployed. Uh, so gentlemen, what do you all think is happening? John, tell us real quick uh, your thoughts on uh, the economy and COVID. Where are we? I think with the economy, and let me just let's say something about Austin, Texas, and unintended consequences. And unintended consequences that my executive secretary of 20, of 20 years called and said, my house is going for 300,000 more than what I thought it was gonna go for. And we're moving to the lake and we're selling the house. And I think that's one of the interesting things that's an interesting trends that's sort of unanticipated. The other trend of course, is I really watch the gig economy. I wanna know two things. Will people return to work? I got a I got a call uh, last week from the, the managers of Hoover's, which is a restaurant here in Austin, and he absolutely could not find workers to get his restaurant going. So, in in conjunction, perhaps with the with the with the stimulus money, one of the things we're looking at is the gig economy. Remember, we need to measure the gig economy because here in Austin, about fifty eight percent of the people could work at home. So the question is, if we have great musicians if we have great restaurants and those kind of things, what will that economy look like? And we must comment on what's coming out of uh, Washington, DC. And, uh, and, and, the, and the theoretical question is, we think that it will be helpful, but the question is, will it take away incentives also? So it might be a delay in the creativity of people because they will have some money coming in, not much of course, but some money coming in in Washington too to take care of, of some of the needs based on the effects of the pandemic. So mm -hmm. going forward, we really have to look at and try to measure the impact of the people who really, really lost jobs. And in connection with that, there have been so many different kinds of business models that have developed. The most interesting one I find is that I have a friend and he builds sheds in the back of houses. Mm -hmm. but these sheds are becoming big time offices Mm -hmm. So, you know, you walk out and, and, and you have a shed outside and it, and it looks like an office that is essentially downtown. And the other thing, of course, is just the whole impact on the housing industry, how people are redoing their backyards, how people are creating uh, home offices. So there are a lot of trends to look at. And we know the most interesting one is the stock market. That really has not been affected but it will be affected soon as we raise interest rates because we know that interest rates are bad for businesses, but great for consumers. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Llewellyn, what do you think? Well, I, I think that it's very strange starting with the restaurants and, and it's true across the country, a shortage of restaurant workers when they were the hardest hit when the pandemic arrived. I wonder where these workers have gone to, how they have found alternative employment and why they're not returning to the restaurant trade. Uh, I think the housing bubble is frankly frightening. I saw what happened with the housing bubble sequentially in England. It just makes it very hard on young people starting out or on people of very limited means. They cannot buy a house. It is too expensive. More people live with their parents longer, that kind of thing. It distorts a higher housing cost. If you're selling a house like uh, Johnny's executive secretary and moving to the lake, that's very advantageous. So if you're selling a house in a high, highly uh, charged market and you can move to a less charged market, that's probably effective. But for the nation as a whole, high housing prices, unrelated to the underlying value of constructing and, and operating a house are not good for the nation. They are bad for the nation. They favor the rich over the poor. They favor the 
the employed over the, the less well and well employed over the less well employed. Uh, it's not a good thing. It may be good for some people. And we don't know. I think interest rates will rise. They don't frighten me terribly. I think that might affect the stock market. But there is a lot of money, as Johnny and I have been saying on these programs week after week, a lot of money around it has nowhere to go. Now it has to buy a very expensive house, but otherwise the only place for it is in the stock market. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure that there's going to be that immediate impact on the market. The market now has so many players that are not professional players that uh, are gambling. That's a greater danger than high interest rates. The gamblers are coming in through Robin Hood and other easy access to the stock market. Uh, portals that did not exist here to fall. Yeah, yeah, good points, good point. <laughs> well, Sunil could use uh, any of that money sitting on the sidelines to increase the acceleration of his journey. Uh, and if Sunil was a surfer, which I don't know exactly if he is or not, even though we've known each other a long time. Very hard in Colorado. He would be, he, he would be one of those guys on the Mavericks. Uh, on the top of those uh, 30 foot waves uh, to surf him because he's uh, truly been building the, 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 the dream of microgrid. So Sunil, COVID impact from your point of view globally, how do you see it happening in the US but everywhere else that you're doing business? And then how is the economy doing? On the personal front, you know, I'm uh, kind of faced with uh, uh, kind of a, you know, two opposites, if you will, you know, here in the U.S. and especially in the Fort Collins in Colorado, uh, from a COVID perspective, things are looking good, numbers are down, things are beginning to look like we are returning to normal uh, as much as we can. Uh, but uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm from India and my parents are there, my family is there, we have a development team there, and the situation there is just diametrically opposite, right? It's just uh, out of control. And uh, what looked like, uh, you know, um, an under control situation in, you know, January, early February, just so quickly spiraled out of control. Mm -hmm. And now it's uh, just this morning, I got an email saying that uh, one of the software developers we have in our office in India, you know, was just tested post uh, COVID positive, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's, uh, you know, for me, I'm kind of stuck between those two realities and, uh, what I just had to do was uh, I had a plan to go to uh, India just to, at the end of this month for my father's uh, 89th birthday. I had to cancel it. And all the flights are canceled, can't go. So anyway, I'm stuck between this um, two opposites. And I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, the trend will change and uh, things will start uh, uh, looking more and more reasonable everywhere. Yeah. A similar situation on the business front, uh, since a lot of our customers are international, um, uh, you know, the, the project deployments are all slowed down. So 2020, everything took a backseat because nobody could deploy any equipment. You couldn't send people to the field. Um, it, this year actually started with a lot of that sort of opening up. And there was a lot of pent up demand to actually get these delayed projects off the ground and whatnot. So there's a lot of activity and it's a very uh, palpable in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, uh, microgrid is the, you know, it, it's the flavor of the day everywhere, I think. Uh, whether that trend actually builds up and continues, I don't know yet. Uh, the delays we're seeing, I, I, you know, I think they are temporary. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the momentum that's been building up uh, uh, and the benefits that you can actually stand to capture are actually real. So I think that's... Uh, if I look back at the past five years, I'd say that that momentum has never been this high and it feels yeah. like it's, it's real in the industry. Yeah, no, those are great points. And, and you're absolutely right internationally. Uh, some countries beyond India, Brazil and others are uh, having some serious flares uh, back. And that's very, very concerning. Again, one, one death is one too many. Uh, so tell us real quick, I, you know, I think I, I, I did a good job of uh, paraphrasing from your website what you guys do, uh, and obviously many of us know really well what you do, but walk us through spray, spray wave, what do you guys do, the kind of size of microgrids, what are we talking about, is it my house, is it a neighborhood, is it, you know, how do you quantify the, the, this project so, so that our audience can get a better sense for 
uh, the great work that you guys do? There are sort of two things uh, in what Spire does in particular um, as it relates to microgrids. Uh, one portion is, I think, what a lot of people equate with microgrids is the microgrid controller, sort of the control software to manage your, you know, um, solar, your storage, your loads, uh, your backup gensets, and then putting some controls around it to actually operate it uh, the way you want it to. So that's really the, the control software part. And that's been, you know, uh, some people would argue that's been around forever, right? So it's, there's really no uh, magic new technologies there. Uh, it's really an integration problem. Um, the second part of it is uh, really, look, when you look at uh, who deploys microgrids, uh, you're asking residential versus, uh, you know, commercial versus industrial versus islands and whatnot. There are all kinds of segments that are actually out there. And of course, including uh, uh, electric utilities or utility owned microgrids, right? So whole, uh, whole spectrum of um, uh, uh, microgrid types that are actually out there. And when you look at those areas, uh, you find um, uh, suppliers or solution providers that are targeting those sectors. Um, and uh, you know, their interest of course is to scale up microgrids. They wanna roll out hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of microgrids as opposed to a, an end user who may just want one. You know, in my home, if I want a microgrid, I want one microgrid and that's that, right? I think those are two very different problems. Uh, so um, enabling service providers to actually uh, activate microgrids like you activate uh, cable servers in your home. That's kind of the, I think the sort of the holy grail of uh, this type of hybrid energy systems. Unless you can do that, you don't scale it up. So we have those two parts, the control software and the, uh, and the platform to actually uh, uh, do the lifecycle management to actually activate services everywhere. Those are the two things that we primarily do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, guys, any questions? Yes, I do have a question. I think that the, the, and I'm working with the company I would like to introduce you to in Austin on, on, on microgrids. What, what is what's interesting to me is it's the software and how it would interact with the regular utility companies. Uh, you know, well, you know, we talk about standards. We talk about in computers, we, we say that, okay, I don't want to uh, bring that component to my computer because it's not standard. And as we look at the cross fertilization, if you will, of the different grids in America, and as you think about your software and look at all of your customers, is there a sense that you need to be able to talk to on a software side, to, to integrate on the software side, you know, the established uh, utility companies? Because usually uh, what we have, I think, and I might be wrong, is that we are developing the ability for the grids to speak with each other, but we are not there yet. So from that, from that interactive side, how do you view the future? Are you writing additional software? How do you bring them online? Uh, if I had a microgrid, may I sell it to you? Uh, what's your business model in thinking about those things? Great, great questions. Um, and I, I'm not sure uh, <clears throat> I can, <laughs> Uh, do full justice to the range of questions there. But let me uh, maybe uh, break it up into sort of three components, right? Uh, especially that uh, uh, how do you um, uh, best interact with the uh, utility systems as you scale up what's the interoperability that's actually required uh, from both from a software and an electrical you know, power perspective. Um, the first one I would say is the electrical interconnection, right? So there are uh, all kinds of standards there to make sure that the, from an electric power perspective, the interconnection is safe and you can actually do that. So the technologies are all there. I think, of course, there can always be better standardization. So that's one piece. And a lot of times when people talk about connecting a microgrid, that's the point of connection with the utility that you're talking about. And I think yeah, uh, those are mature technologies uh, and I think available at scale. The second part, um, you know, that you're alluding to is from a software perspective, how do you interact with an electric utilities uh, backend systems, right? So, uh, and then you're really looking at sort of the technical interoperability. How do you exchange data? Uh, how can you uh, make sure that you're not blind to each other sort of thing? So if you look at the pure uh, data transfer uh, uh, part of it, and can you actually standardize that? Again, I think there are lots of mature technologies and now there are standards like you know, 2030.5 and all that people are trying to uh, you know, rally around. Uh, so that portion is, um, uh, is um, uh, I think, getting mature. Uh, there's room for improvement, but that's another piece. 
Where I think the real problem lies uh, is not in either of the first two, it's in the third area, where when you actually say, okay, so I can talk to an electric utility system, and here comes a thousand uh, you know, small commercial things or restaurants or whoever that wants to talk to the utilities backend system, a very brutal uh, backend system that's never, that was never designed to actually manage uh, you know, uh, um, systems like that. And it's not because of the data exchange, it's because of the, the workflow and the business models and the contractual agreements that have to all come into place. That's where I think we are seeing uh, the primary barriers. Uh, you know, that's why you really cannot scale. Unfortunately, I think it gets sometimes framed as a data exchange problem or, a, or an interface problem, which I really don't believe it is. What Spiray does is uh, we're acting as a universal translator. I really don't care about uh, protocols or standards. Use whatever you want. We can essentially adapt to that. And most technology companies can quickly adapt to those things. I don't think it's a lack of standards that you're suffering from. Thank you. I would like to ask you, Sunil, that's very interesting, by the way, and I'm pleased to meet you. I, uh, what is the motivation for microgrids? Every day I give emails uh, um, saying they have this virtue, that virtue, they're going to clean up the atmosphere, they're going to uh, uh, be more resilient, more of everything. But what is the true motivation? Are they going to, is it economic? Is it social or is it actually in the improving the quality and uh, reliability of electric supply? Why would we want more microgrids in short? Great question. Um, I don't think there's one answer for it um, because um, if you look at energy consumers uh, around the world, there are all kinds of different classes of users, right? So it actually, um, the benefits accrue differently depending on where you are. Uh, so if you take today and you say, where are microgrids uh, uh, incredibly cost competitive and uh, you know, uh, immediately viable, they tend to be any location that has a sort of a fossil fuel displacement opportunity period, right? So they tend to be weak grid situations or island situations, you're burning diesels or heavy fuel oils, you bring in renewables and storage and you completely change the equation there. Very quick value proposition right here both on the economic front and on the carbon reduction front, right? And resilience, they, it also improves your system performance. So uh, all of those actually accrue in that case. At the very other end of the spectrum, if you just look at, you know, right here in Fort Collins and say, you know, I, I want a residential microgrid, the value proposition is actually quite different. There may be some economic benefits right away because of a uh, time of use pricing or demand charges or something like that, that you can actually um, uh, capture right away. Uh, since the grid is, uh, you know, relatively, you know, very stable, you know, the Texas type situations are, don't happen very often, right? Um, so um, that's a case where, yeah, you can capture that benefit, but that's a very small segment of the energy users that actually would want to invest in that particular value. Now, if, if I talk to my uh, children, I mean, it's a completely different situation. They only care about the uh, carbon reduction and sustainability. And, uh, you know, I'm terrified when I want to throw away a you know, little piece of plastic in the trash. I have to think twice nowadays before I do that. So the mindset and the perception uh, of, uh, I think, a you know, very rapidly growing, um, you know, part of uh, our population here and around the world, I think, is around sustainability and what's the right way to actually bring renewables and sustainable energy into play. Microgrids are the path to that. So the, how you value that uh, ends up being, you know, it, it, it differs. For Spire, uh, we our rallying cry is, uh, we call it uh, localize, personalize, decarbonize. And I think localize means leverage your existing resources, you know, uh, solar on the rooftop, uh, an electric vehicle in your garage, uh, load control where you can. Uh, you can bring all of those things. Those are all local resources that people have direct access to. So if you can localize, that's a very big deal. And uh, I'm sure, you know, um, uh, most of our audience might be familiar with this, but if I can displace a, a kilowatt hour in my home uh, by doing something here locally, the upstream effect all the way through distribution, transmission, uh, uh, somewhere you're mining coal and transporting, it's enormous. I mean, the multiplicative value is tremendous. So I think that's where that localized part is very important. The second one that we call personalized, I think is kind of cuts to your question. Everybody has, I want one thing, my neighbor wants something completely different. And so long as we assume that we're gonna make both of us happy with the same thing, 
not going to happen, right? And so uh, I think the, the the uniform kilowatt hour model is over, right? So I think uh, that's where microgrids can really shine because you can actually fine tune uh, it for cost for me, for renewables for my neighbor on this side, resilience for my neighbor on the other side. And you can do it with the same infrastructure, same equipment, and you can uh, activate services like this anywhere. I think that's the true power of microgrids. Yeah, so so let me, so let me follow up on that. It seems like uh, there is uh, quite a bit going on and I'm curious, where do you see? I know that, you know, clearly, um, you know, as a, as a company wanting to, um, you know, transform the world, the, the highest bang for the buck is selling at the enterprise level, what's called commercial and industrial in the utility industry. Uh, but it's really interesting, Sunil, uh, Tesla just released their quarterly results for Q1 and they share that the sales of power walls is up 70% year on year and the sale of their solar rooftops is up 64% year on year. Do you see a similar growth or a similar pent up demand on the commercial industrial side that reflects what Tesla is sharing as the results in the US, which I think is are, you know, huge? Uh, yes, uh, what we are really seeing, you know, the, uh, I cannot say that we are seeing the, uh, the uh, year to year increase for us over the past two, three years at, at a 70% year on year growth yet. But if you just look at the inbound interest, uh, the sort of the general um, uh, interest from, um, you know, um, very different segments that, uh, uh, you know, two years ago, I wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't have thought that they would be very interested in this at all. Uh, so you're actually seeing a much more broad-based interest in these uh, technologies and uh, what's actually going on. So that we're absolutely seeing. So, so um, who, yeah. who are you? Who could you share in terms of segments? Is it hospitals? Is it the Department of Defense? Is it is it mining? Is it who is who is driving this demand? Yeah. So again, uh, uh, one clarification there. Um, you have the end user, and then you have the parties that are actually targeting those end users as customers. Mm -hmm. Where Spire is actually working with that intermediate party, right? So they are the they are the service provider. So, um, uh, so that's who I can speak more, uh, uh, you know, directly to. Mm -hmm. Now, the good thing for us on that is that since uh, our channel partners are targeting different segments, we do get a pretty broad based view into you know, where the interest is actually coming from. Um, so some areas like, for example, the mining sector and all that, uh, I think the, the commercial reality is here and now. So that's almost, uh, you know, the, the, it's a commercial interest. It's really not a market development interest anymore. You can immediately go in and uh, make those value proposals. There's a lot of activity going on there right now. The intermediate area, when, when you look at, um, you know, commercial, small industrial type applications, there is a, again, it depends on the, on the space. If, you're, if it's in North America, for example, mm -hmm. a lot of the innovations are around, uh, uh, you know, simplifying it, uh, call it energy as a service, right? So you want to bundle everything and actually offer that uh, uh, as a service. And then these intermediate parties are actually looking for platforms that can actually do that, right? So you need the platform to offer energy as a service, and then you need the nodal control technology to make it work, right? So uh, that's where um, we see, um, you know, people that are uh, targeting uh, areas like, uh, you know, um, uh, wineries in California and uh, agricultural applications, hydroponic applications. And so you're seeing specialized uh, uh, approaches to that. So the good news, I think, is that, uh, you know, I think the industry has you know, pretty much realized that you're not, you're not, there's no one thing called a micro, that's a silver bullet for everybody, right? You really have to, tailor it uh, for the segment that you're actually addressing. And it's not because of the, the sort of the engineering or the control software. It's just that understanding the domain, if without the domain understanding, you cannot really standardize it and deliver these solutions at a, at a, at a cost-effective price point. That's where the standardization is actually happening. And that's what we're actually uh, seeing with our channel partners. They, special, they look at these sub-segments uh, we call them microgrid types, right? So that's Spire's lingo to actually say, these are the patterns that actually work for that. And we work with them to, uh, to address that. And then you do that for different areas to essentially 
reduce the engineering or the people cost of building microgrids, uh, you know, you know, cut it down by 90%. That's really what needs to occur. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what we're seeing. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask, uh, what is the management structure of a microgrid? Now, I can understand it if it's a university or if it's a hospital complex. But when you move to residential microgrids, who's in charge? And uh, who, who has the legal responsibility? Should there be a fire or, God forbid, an electrocution? Right. I'm sure there are some uh, open-ended issues, uh, uh, you know, uh, with regard to liabilities in that context. Um, the way to think about a microgrid, you know, in, in that particular context, I would say is, uh, you know, what happens when you buy a Nest thermostat and you swap out your whole old thermostat and plug in the plug in the new thermostat. There are two things that are going on, right? Uh, one is you've actually enabled a new piece of software, a new control system to do something. But on the other side, your existing equipment remains exactly the same. It's the same HVAC unit or air conditioner or whatever it is on the other side that's actually there. Now, have you really changed the uh, the liability situation right there, uh, you know, and I think microgrids are in 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 a, uh, a very similar situation because when you uh, when you install a a Tesla Powerwall, right? So there are certain things that actually go with uh, you know making sure that that's actually to code and actually approved, and there's some liabilities that actually come with that. And if you buy the solar from somebody else and put it on your rooftop, same situation. The microgrid piece is just like that, uh, that thermostat, right? It's, it's a control software. It hasn't really changed the, uh, the underlying um, you know, situation with the pieces of equi equipment. They came with their own mature um, you know, uh, pathways there. So my feeling is that uh, um, you know, it shouldn't change the, the structure at all. Uh, what you're really looking doing with that is um, you know, the economic benefits or the resilience benefits and are, are, are just leveraging uh, existing equipment with standard and well understood characteristics. Well, yeah, it seems to me then that the the electric cars and the microgrids are just born for each other. It seems to me that they will drive each other. And when I say that, I'm thinking about the places where you'll be able to plug in as you maneuver around a country. And by the way, I'll say this on this program. I also think that electric grids will be mobile for those individuals who are, who, who are stuck. You know, we think about electric grids as being, as being just stable. As yeah, being, yeah. And I think also they will be airborne in a lot of ways because of the friction that can create uh, the battery power. So my question is, it would seem to me that the development of electric cars is, I mean, it is, it is your sweet spot. I mean, you guys get together and, and not just the ones that's going to homes, I'm talking about, as, as, as Llewellyn would say, as private enterprise take over uh, the issues related to electric cars. Where do I plug in? I've got to drive from here to El Paso. Where do I stop? Uh, do you look at a great situation with electric cars or electric vehicles, I might add, in the future? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we are definitely seeing a lot more interest in. Uh, uh, sort of integrating uh, the EVSC or the electric vehicle charging, the smart charging infrastructures uh, with microgrids. And then it opens up uh, all kinds of interesting possibilities, right? At the very lowest level, uh, your electric uh, charging post, that's not moving around, right? That charging post is in a fixed, uh, it's, it's a finite uh, location. Um, it's no different uh, from my perspective from, you know, this uh, light bulb up here, you know, I can turn the switch on or off, that thing doesn't move, right? So when I do load control, it's a similar situation. When I want to manage that, I don't know if the light is on or off, right? You get what you get. And then if it's on, perhaps I can do something to lower the load. And maybe there are different lighting levels that I can put it to. So from a, an individual um, device or charging station perspective, it's the same thing with electric vehicles. When you come and plug in, the intelligence is actually in the conversation between the car and what it actually plugged into, right? And uh, you have everything from very simple devices, uh, uh, you know, all the way to much more sophisticated, you know, charging ecosystems where there's a lot of lot more going on there. 
So what we are running into, and where we're working with some um, uh, EVSC companies, um, we, we essentially want the interoperability. So when a car comes and plugs in, there are two things that are important. One is, what does the car need from a, from a power perspective? How much energy does that need and by when? Then the other thing that's important is, what's the contractual obligation there, right? So uh, is, is it in charge uh, instantly or is it say, you know, I have flexibility and uh, you're getting a slightly lower cost from somebody to actually do that. So there's that contractual element that comes into play as well. Again, that's that's the kind of stuff that makes it interesting, and I think that'll take longer for the models to actually mature. From a micro perspective, uh, you know, we look at it as uh, two levels of integration. One level of integration is just for the charge station, and we can deal with the situation with whatever vehicle comes and charges in there. The second one is the contractual agreement that says, okay, how can I use that? Am I allowed to disconnect that uh, if there is a peak situation, or am I not? That is no longer with the charging station. That's with some other service providers, entirely different infrastructure. They, they're very different. They're getting more and more complex. And uh, anybody that's addressing fleets and all that are looking at very complex uh, route planning and all kinds of things that come into play. So it's no longer uh, just a case of saying, charge my car. In a home case, it's probably that straightforward. Uh, but that's so it's a, it's a very interesting space. And you're absolutely right that um, that uh, uh, transportation electrification can be a big driver in this, and it, it is happening. Uh, the last point I would add is, um, you know, from an electric power perspective, um, there are a lot of uh, fleet companies that are now finding that they are now uh, uh, distribution constrained. They're, they exceed the capacity of the distribution transformer or whatever if you uh, try to put in too many vehicles. How do you manage that? So now suddenly you have this, uh, you know, back to the same, uh, you know, electric grid, uh, you know, transformation question. Uh, do I have to absolutely upgrade my distribution line or uh, can I do some intelligent management to stay below the threshold and allow, allow that uh, transaction to happen? That's the kind of thing where I think the smart part of it uh, really can come into play and really open up this market. But so long as we, cannot get past this thing they're saying that if I put in a 20 vehicles over here, I don't believe that the software can keep the load below my uh, distribution transformers load. That's a much bigger problem. And, uh, you know, uh, that I think the, the, the uh, grid transformation folks are, you know, really worrying about. As you know, I worry about, there was an old movie before your time called When the World Stood Still. And the person oh. came from outer space and all of a sudden, nothing worked. All of the cars stopped. All the smart cities stopped. And the entire planet was in some kind of suspension. <laughs> so I think that the opportunities for security are great in the future. I also think that vehicles will probably be able to generate their own electricity by the relationship between friction, right, and, and, uh, and creating power. But I think microgrids are the place to be, whether they are plug in or whether they're in motion. But it's obvious, obvious that you are the new electricity that's coming down the road. So, so, so to add to that, it seems like you know the last six months there have been a quite a bit of uh, evolution on momentum. You know, uh, American Electric Power, Duke Energy. Um, uh, several utilities of the East Coast, Eversource, many others have announced, you know, plans for multi-regional charging networks. Uh, you know, the new administration announced the fact that they're going to swap all their 700,000 vehicles into electric, uh, you know, time, time permitting, uh, uh, inventory permitting. Uh, you know, Amazon has made all kinds of investments into Rivian and they have put an order for 100,000 uh, you know, EV trucks, uh, you know, Ford, uh, Volkswagen, uh, all these guys are moving into electric, General Motors, they're all investing in batteries, technologies. I mean, when you think about the fact that there are 400 million registered vehicles in the U.S., if somehow 20 million, 30, 60 million, 100 million of those vehicles over the next 20 years switch to electric, it would be a dream of opportunities on how you manage the grid, integrate with the grid and so on. And furthermore, 
you know, there is all this money for R and D and for smart grids in particular, a hundred billion dollars. Now, now that said, uh, you know, uh, Sunil, I'm wondering uh, in the conversations with the utilities, how many of the utilities are rethinking having a standalone, call it, you know, somewhat intelligent, fragile grid to a set of standalone, highly interconnected balance authorities within their own grid. They are more resilient among each other. So for example, you know, I put forth a proposal for Texas to re reimagine the IRCA territory from one single balancing authority to eight balancing authorities and eight microgrids. Well, in you, you, you probably spent some time in, in, in Puerto Rico and then in, in probably bid on some of those projects to rebuild Puerto Rico. And, and I know that this is a big topic in Southeast Asia. Where is the thinking about re-architecting the grid of the future with your technology as a core, if you will? Um, what can I say? I think- uh, <laughs> It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have to think about what not to say. Right? <laughs> um, I think, as you know, I mean, these conversations have been around for quite some time. So the last time um, Spire was engaged with some conversations, Puerto Rico was, it's probably coming up in 10 years. Uh, we did some very innovative projects in, the, in Denmark years ago uh, around the same idea of what we call cellular grids, so to actually bring in resiliency by bringing in more intelligence into the existing uh, infrastructure. Had so many conversations with uh, the Hawaii, uh, you know, uh, the electric uh, utility crash, not to mention all the, the major ones here in the US. Uh, the, uh, when you frame the question as you did to say that, you know, you have the potential to actually have a much more resilient grid with, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned in Aircard having different control areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a it's a similar situation. You can you can decide is it eight or eight hundred. It, it uh, that's a technical uh, the technical part. I think the answer you'll get is that, yep, go to eight hundred. You are better off. Right? The technical answer is I think is pretty clear cut. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and as you roll it up, I think there are lots of. Uh, you know, um, uh, models to actually make that work. And if you look at it purely from an electric power system perspective, uh, you're looking at the hierarchy of substations and you can decide where the, the control nodes are and how you actually build up resiliency from there. So I don't think there's any uh, shortage of smart people that actually know how to actually do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you switch gears and then you look at uh, why is that not happening? You know, that's really, a, I think, a, a, an, an economic incentives question, I think. And it's, it really comes down to rate recovery and saying, you know, how do I, how do I make that work? Um, so I do, I'm, I'm not the expert in that, so I don't want to speak, speak too much to that. But I think that's what it comes down to, to actually be able to provide the right incentives to the right parties. Right now, the moment it gets framed like this, uh, it's a winner and loser, and the winner is not the existing party. And right. that creates uh, all kinds of challenges and it slows everything down. Yeah, it, it, it seems to me, and I'll uh, switch to Llewellyn here in a moment, that, that the, the, there is clearly a grid edge phenomenon going on with the EVs and the solar panels and the power walls and all that, that is almost at some point catching a momentum that is going to be unmanageable by the traditional grid guys, right? And it'll be fascinating to see when they decide to come to you, somebody who can make it all talk, right? Uh, and so anyway, th that's just, I think timing, the timing is brewing. This is the, the perfect storm is aligning. At some point, Spray may end up being a billion dollar IPO. All right. Llewellyn? So Neil, I, I wonder what's the, is there a downside? I'm a thrust and drag man. If you get thrust, you also get drag uh, in aviation and other things. Um, we went crazy to get coal to uh, help us out of the energy crisis. Environmentalists favored coal over nuclear. Uh, and then, of course, there's been a lot of backpedaling on that one. Uh, are we going to see any pushback against microgrids or find some, uh, some other effect uh, besides those virtuous reasons that have been trotted out for microgrids? Yeah, 
I think yeah, there are certain questions that are actually out there that everybody talks about, like um, uh, you know, cybersecurity. You know, do you do you uh, increase the attack services, and therefore you can argue that the exposure points have suddenly uh, gone through the roof uh, when it comes to integrating DERs. Thank and, you, uh, thank uh, you. You're asking actually what was going to be my next question, but uh, <laughs> cybersecurity and microgrids. Thank you. Please continue. Yeah, so uh, those are uh, issues that people are worrying about, and I think there are um, uh, they need need to be worried about. Uh, but there are also solutions at scale that are already there to secure systems like that. So if the underlying design is not appropriate, then you'll actually create exposures all over the place. I mean, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's, uh, that's the reality. Then there are other problems which I think may actually turn out to be more insidious. You know, like I, I, I gave the example about personalization and saying that, you know, my neighbor wants this, I want this, my person to this side wants something else. You, there is a possibility that you'll actually see, uh, you know, what, what was it called years ago? The, uh, um, uh, you know, when the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Prius came out, the Prius effect, right? You, you are seeing neighborhoods with uh, all Priuses and uh, you go down the road, you know, it's, it's all pickup trucks, right? Uh, so, uh, the that type effect. of stuff, I think, yeah, you know, the uh, microgrids may actually uh, accentuate those types of uh, differences um, and cause other types of uh, social issues uh, that may be actually more problematic than the cyber cybersecurity issue. Yeah. Uh, I think that's probably what uh, I would say, you know, the true potential of microgrids is to differentiate. It's not to necessarily unify. Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, would come with all kinds of uh, issues with that, I would say, uh, is probably one of those hidden issues that uh, I'd worry about. So let, let's, pause for let, let's pause for one second here. Uh, let me make sure that I uh, share uh, my screen and show you guys uh, our Digital 360 Summit coming up August 31st to September 2nd. And... Uh, these are the companies that have spoke last year and it was a fascinating uh, event. And obviously uh, Spray is there somewhere. Uh, and I wanna thank Texas State University for uh, sponsoring our um, uh, digital round table. So let me come back real quick uh, to something, uh, you know, the, the kind of technology that you require to enable with your solution has some building blocks, software, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Can you talk about that? And then connectivity, fiber ideally, but what is the impact of 5G or 6G or Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7? Where do you see wireless broadband uh, accelerating things? Are those two trends helping microgrids, AI, and, and, broad, and wireless broadband? So all of those things that you mentioned are absolutely going to help micro, microgrids. The question is, uh, are any of them necessary today in order to enable microgrids? I, I distinguish between the two, right? So it's the, and what's the cake and what's the icing on the cake? Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things like, you know, for example, 5G and all the related technologies there, uh, we have uh, major customers asking us for that, and we are going to you know, telcos and whoever and saying, you know, how do we actually uh, enable that? And then what's interesting is, um, you know, anybody that's looking at doing uh, microgrids at scale, they really do need those types of solutions because you cannot depend on a customer Wi-Fi or, you know, uh, trying to wire Ethernet cables wherever you go. So anything that provides connectivity as a built-in option, uh, I think will uh, absolutely help with the scaling of microgrids. Today, a lot of microgrid players are looking at, uh, if you ask them, they'd say, you know, uh, one to two megawatt microgrids is my sweet spot. That's where, that's where we play. Or they'll, be, they'll have some uh, uh, range like that. As the size of the microgrids gets smaller, uh, the standardization of these technologies have to increase. Right? So, if I have to do 100 kilowatt microgrids, I have to do you know 100 of them to actually make a viable business, uh, as opposed to one 10 megawatt micro where none of these issues are a problem because you can sort of custom engineer uh, your solution. So that scaling and the types of technologies you are talking about are directly correlated, and uh, uh, connectivity and communication is probably the core piece 
along with, of course, a, a secure infrastructure. That's actually very key as well. Uh, you cannot just be riding on anybody's Wi-Fi on, on stuff like this. So uh, you have that part. Yeah. When it comes to things like uh, AI and machine learning and all that, I would I would put that on the icing on the cake uh, part where, you know, nine out of 10 things that you can actually capture, you got to be able to capture it with the technologies you have today. And then once the data infrastructure is there, you need a certain volume and a flow of data before these uh, ML and stuff like that can actually do anything, right? You know, with one data point, you're not going to be able to do much at all. So that's, again, I think it'll, it comes one step uh, later, but I think without the right underlying infrastructure, you won't get there. So there's an architectural dependency, which, uh, you know, companies like ours are actually addressing. But what about, what about your thoughts on blockchain? Does blockchain have a role to play in, in transactive energy or microgrids? Um, you know, a long time ago when the Twitter came out, I looked at it and said, you know, who the heck is going to use this thing? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm terrified to say anything about blockchain. Right? <laughs> so, um, so I think um, the level of interest in blockchain, the fact that you can have a distributed ledger to actually keep tra track of the transaction, I think that's, those are fantastic underlying technologies. Right. But today, I think the bigger problem is uh, so put blockchain aside for the moment and you say, I want to transact something with my neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. Where I want the transaction cost to be low and I want the trust to actually be there. Right now, let's say I just totally trust my neighbor and we're happy to do this thing. Can I do that? No, I cannot, right? Because you're regulatorily blocked from doing that. Blockchain cannot solve it. <laughs> so I think so that, may, that's it. So maybe what we need is open chain, not blockchain. Oh, there you go. There, I like that. I like that. I think you should run with it. Do, do we, uh, Sunil, do we need regulatory reform to accelerate microgrids? Are there regulatory impediments? Absolutely, yes. I think there is no doubt about it. Um, and if I pick one specific example, I'd say, um, you know, if you look at the regulatory framework and the you know, the, ta the incentive framework, the tax incentives and all that are actually tied to things like that. We are in a very siloed world. Energy efficiency is one bucket, solar, another bucket, uh, storage, another bucket, right? Um, and then you're going to say, you know, smart grid, a different bucket for somebody else. But the fact is, unless we can find some uniformity and have uh, metrics that uh, uh, are different. So if you want a resilience metric, use a resilience metric. If you want a carbon reduction metric, you know, maybe use something like a GAG metric and get away from the technology focused regulations and instead uh, look at outcome based regulations. I think just just that would have a tremendous uh, effect in actually getting the right solutions in place as opposed to chasing short term demand response was I think a classic example of uh, Again, you know, speaking out of school of how not to do something. Right? Uh, yeah. uh, you're creating a model that's short-lived, creates a spike, and it falls off the cliff. And everybody's saying, oh, what happened? Well, what happened is that the way in which the whole model was structured in the first place was wrong. Yeah. What, what regulations would you like to see changed immediately? Is there a single regulation or a single set of regulations which are impeding development? So while, while you're thinking that real quick, and I think he 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 maybe already answered, but I have a con. So do or do, do does FERC order A41 uh, allowing DER to play in the wholesale market, and then order 2222 allowing aggregators to emerge? Do you see those two orders as perhaps laying the foundation for for a big higher adoption of microgrids? They're definitely in the right direction. I think those are required. Uh, I'm not sure those are sufficient yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I well, think there are other, uh, you know, um, impediments along the way. Um, you know, if you look at some of the debates around, um, you know, a, a, the DSO role of a utility mm -hmm. versus market participation, I think there are very big issues in the way before you can actually participate in things like that at scale. Yeah, I think, let me ask this question. I think that demand will solve a lot of your problems. I'm, I'm predicting that there, be, there will be 400 makers of electric cars in America. I wonder how many microgrids would be needed in America. Have you thought about how the competition and how 
what's going on in America now in terms of EVs and et cetera will actually drive what you're doing. And more importantly, here's my direct question. How many microgrid companies do you think will evolve in America? If I think there are going to be, four, remember there are 480 producers of electric cars in China. And remember, this is not a big combustion engine like, like, uh, so, like Andrea's great, great Corvette. This is where you print out the shell in, 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 in 3D printing and you put the battery in it, put, put some tires and take off. Very powerful coat. How do you think about that moving forward? I mean, were, were they litter the landscape like uh, in the old days, the, the train stations did? What do you see? Um, I didn't quite hear the first part of what you said. Were you asking how many microgrids? Uh, yeah, would be required? how many microgrids would be needed to get to where we need to go in okay. 2040? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, I started off by saying that there is no one thing that qualifies as a microgrid because uh, if I, uh, Spiray's very generalized uh, uh, definition is that uh, if there's more than one uh, controllable asset, that's a target for a microgrid, right? So you, you have more than one thing on the energy side that you, that you want to manage for some purpose. So suddenly you need a little bit of intelligent software to actually combine those disparate things to achieve some outcome for somebody, right? If you define a microgrid in that, in that fashion, I would say that uh, every location that has a metered electricity point is a target candidate for, for a microgrid, right? So, you know, now that's way too expansive. I, mean, I can, uh, you know, I, I can go with, um, you know, 200 million homes uh, uh, plus all the businesses in there and that's your uh, upper limit number. Yep. Uh, but I think a more reasonable answer to that is to uh, really look at it um, you know, uh, from the perspective of the different DER players that are actually coming into play, right? So when a when an electric vehicle manufacturer comes in, they are also supplying a charging infrastructure. There is an incentive for them to say, you can interoperate with the solar that's uh, installed uh, wherever. So I think we're going to see a lot of innovation actually driven for interoperability from a device uh, centric perspective. So all the smart home technologies that we've been talking about. You know, you can now plug in a third, you know, a, a home device that will talk to a lot of the other things in your home uh, more interactively. I think that's the direction in which microgrids will go, and you'll start seeing the uh, the intelligence increase. It's actually very, very pervasive. But what we look at as a conventional microgrid today, when you say I can find it at a you know defense uh, base where you put a very highly publicized uh, you know a twenty million dollar microgrid, that's not going to be the means by which this scales. You're actually going to see the scaling at the other end of the spectrum. So it'll be answer. somewhere between those extremes. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, good answer. Thank you. Llewellyn, any, any, any other questions from you? Well, yes, I, I would like to go back to my question. Any particular law today, is the solution to the impediments, is it with FERC? Is it with the Congress? Is it with state legislatures? And do you have a list of changes you'd like to see in law, which would facilitate your activities. The one thing in the short run uh, that I'd like to see uh, is probably a scale up of uh, uh, the uh, recent proposal. Uh, what was it the, um, that came out of uh, um, a California congressman uh, for the microgrid uh, incentive, right? The similar to the tax credits. Uh, focusing on microgrids and looking at the outcomes there. I think that has certain limitations, but I think that class of uh, 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 policies uh, would have the most impact in actually unifying all of the earlier silos that I mentioned, right? That's really the key. You got to get away from those siloed uh, policy decisions to integrated uh, policy decisions that address um, uh, energy as a, you know, or energy management as a unified opportunity. Uh, the policies, the interconnection requirements, the uh, uh, incentives, if they're aligned a lot around that, I think that will have the most impact on actually deploying solutions like this without having to, you know, turn yourself into a pretzel to actually fit into very narrowly defined um, regulations. Sure. Thank you. I understand very much what you mean by siloing. I see siloing all over the place is a great frustration and problem. It's not 
alas, confined to electricity. Per per perhaps I volunteer uh, uh, acceleration of deregulation and competition coming back uh, <laughs> would be some that would help microgrids a lot. Uh, unfortunately, we are at the hour, Sunil, and we could talk to you for another 10 hours easily. Uh, this is fascinating. We didn't get to peel the onion and wave and what it does and how it works and what a great job you have done there uh, technologically over the years. And, and we didn't get to talk about any of your projects. So, so maybe you should come back at some point in the near future, if that's okay with you. And I hope that you enjoy our conversation today. Would love to. Thanks for the invite. This was fantastic. Uh, Thank you. You know, uh, you weren't kidding when you said we have no idea where this conversation was going to go. <laughs> but enjoyed it very much. And uh, John and Lovelyn uh, you know, really enjoyed uh, your questions and the discussions. And Andres, as, as usual, you, you pulled together a great team here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, would love to thank, be back. Thank you for joining us, Anil. It's very thank interesting you, to talk to you. And I would like to ask you a whole lot more questions and maybe we'll get an opportunity down the road. And I like talking to the future. I like talking to the future. <laughs> Great. Absolutely. Likewise. Yeah. Absolutely. So Sunil, thank you very much. Johnny, take us away with another song. That's a sprinkle with the blues. I got a few old dreams that I can't use. Cool by my memory. Of things that you Thank you very much. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. Take care. I hope I hope things get better in India very much. Uh, yeah, me too. Likewise.